Our first speaker tonight is a, a very unusual quantity because the capacity in which you know him is not the capacity in which he is here tonight. He is, of course, um, you know, he's been chair, he is chairman of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. He is a member of the Niti Aayog. Uh, he has written over 100 books, many of them in the field of economics, and he's made significant contributions to game theory, to economic theory, uh, to work on social, political, economic inequity. But it is not in this capacity of an economist of incredible stature and repute in this country that Bibek de Broglie is here tonight. That his day job, which is the work of a full lifetime that all of us would spend a full lifetime doing, is only half, if less than that, of what he actually does do. He apparently has two lifetimes because he is, and, and I think the easiest way to frame this accomplishment is that earlier this year, the Limca Book of Records awarded him as the most prolific translator in the country. And now when I say most prolific translator, I mean of the classical ancient texts. He is only the third person ever to translate the unabridged Mahabharat from Sanskrit. And just to contextualize that accomplishment, that is 2.25 million words. He is the only person to have, in fact, uh, translated not just the unabridged Mahabharat, but also the Ramayan, the abridged Puranas, the Harivamsha. And he has now started to translate the unabridged Puranas, which by the time he is completed off this task, will constitute almost 12 million words across 18 volumes, many of which have never been translated into English. Now, wherever you may stand on, your, on the belief spectrum is this myth or history and how much we should engage with it. What has to be said is this. This is not only an act of formidable scholarship, it is an act on behalf of a country to preserve some of the most vital uh, writings of its ancient civilization. So on that account, I think all of us owe him a significant debt of gratitude. Thank you to Mr. Bibek de Broglie, and may we have you up on stage. It's a privilege to have this conversation with you. Good evening, Mr. Debra. We, we have had this conversation, but I would like to ask you again, because uh, I'm sure all of us here want to know, how does somebody who, you're an economist, you studied economics at Presidency College, then Delhi School of Economics, then you, you went to Trinity College at Cambridge. Those credentials in economics are absolutely unimpeachable, stellar. How after that did you suddenly decide to engage with the classical texts, not as a reader, but of a scale of immersion that we pretty much haven't seen by any other individual in the country. Good evening and uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen and thank you Algebra for hosting me again, first time in Hyderabad, but I've been to Algebra events in the past. The question that you asked is apparently a very simple one, but the answer is a little bit complicated. I think the first thing I should sort of state is there is something called the National Manuscript Mission. The National Manuscript Mission is in the business of, at the moment, just listing manuscripts that exist in India in private collections, public collections. Digitization comes much later, at the moment, just listing. It's called Namami, the National Manuscript Mission. Namami has listed so far about 3.5 million manuscripts. A manuscript being defined as something that is more than 75 years old. Namami's estimate is that there are about 40 million manuscripts in the country. There are some which are outside. Just to give you some idea of what that benchmark comparison is, the UN estimates that in every language in the world, since the advent of publishing, about 140 million books have been published if you include every language in the world. So here we have 40 million, there we have 140 million. The point about this 40 million is that 95% of them have never been translated. Quite apart from the fact that a lot of our knowledge transmission happened through the oral mode, it was not written down, it was verbal, and some of that is getting lost. So someone has to sit down and translate this. 
And it's all very well to criticize Harvard or, or Oxford or Heidelberg for not getting the translations or the nuance of the translations right, but that's in some sense negative. It cannot be corrected unless we actually begin to do our own translations. A whole series of events, coincidences, led me to end up doing these translations. And, and the reason I ask is because, for example, the statistics you gave us are staggering. All of us will go away stunned by this and never translate anything in our lives. What was that point of entry for you where you said, I need to do this and I can do this? Um, but this is a bit of a digression, but nonetheless, Many, many years ago, I read two shlokas from two great poets, neither of whom we have been able to date very satisfactorily, but they were separated in time by about 500 years. And these two great poets were Valmiki and Kalidas. Both of, whom, both of whom were fabulous in terms of describing nature. And I will recite two shlokas and then I will translate. The first shloka is from Valmiki and it occurs in the Valmiki Ramayana where Rama already knows that Sita is in Lanka. He is impatient to invade Lanka and rescue Sita. He is held up because it is the monsoon. Until the monsoon is over, he cannot embark on his expedition. And Valmiki, who was a great poet at describing nature, says, Vidyuta pataka savalaka mala shailendra kota kriti sannikasha garjanti megha samudina nada matta gajendra eva sangyugastha. Vidyut pataka means the clouds are tinged by flags of lightning. Savalaka Mala, they are garlanded with cranes which are flying, so they seem like garlands of cranes. Shailendra Kuta Kritisan Nikasha, the clouds are like gigantic mountains. Garjanti Megha, the clouds are thundering. Matta Gajendra Ivasang Yugastha. And what do the clouds resemble? They resemble crazy elephants which are fighting. Kalidasa now. Kalidasa wrote several poems. One of them is known as Megdutam. Megdutam, for those of you who know, or, or for those of you who may not know, Megdutam has no story as such. There is a yaksha who has been banished by his lord and master because he has been derelict in the performance of his duties. His lord and master is Kuvera, so he has been banished away for one year. And while he is away on one, for one year, he sees a cloud and he decides to send that cloud as a messenger to his wife and beloved who is in Kuwait's capital city in Alakafuri. Megdutam, therefore, is the cloud messenger. In the first half, the cloud goes and in the second half, the cloud returns. So right at the beginning of Megdutam, second shloka, it says, Asharasya Prathama Devase Megham Ashlishta Sanum Vapra Kreera Parinata Gaja Prekshaniyam Dadarsha So the Yaksha on the first day in the month of Ashar, which is when monsoon starts, he sees that the, me the clouds are surrounding the mountains and the image he thinks of is Vapra Kreera Parinata Gaja Prekshaniyam Dadasha. He sees these clouds which resemble elephants and what are the elephants doing? The elephants are fighting. My chance encounter with these two shlokas started me thinking about this. And I thought, here are two poets separated by 500 years. They're describing the monsoon clouds and each one of them thinks of the simile of elephants and Rama who is waiting to fight. In Rama's case, the elephants are elephants which are fighting and in the Yaksha's case, who's pining for his beloved, the elephants are playing. And it was almost as if a veil had been lifted from front of my eyes and I thought that if I do not read this literature, I'm losing out on something in life. So this was one trigger 
for starting. At some point, I did unabridged translations, as Pyle mentioned, of the four Vedas, the 11 Upanishads, um, and the 19 Puranas. They were abridged translations. Don't read them in retrospect. They were not very good translations, although they do sell quite a bit still now. I ran into the publisher at a book fair, and the publisher said, um, Debra Sahib, your Vedas are doing very well, but you did an abridged translation. Now I want to do an unabridged translation, because they are on the reading list of Harvard or something like that. I want to do an unabridged translation, and I want to have the English on one side and the Sanskrit on the other. To fend him off, I was not interested, but to fend him off, I said, all right, let me read the Vedas again carefully. So I began to read the Vedas. I had read them before, but when you read them with a view to translating them word by word, you read them word by word, you read them carefully. And I found that in the Rig Veda, there is a reference to dogs being used as beasts of burden. Now, that had not occurred to me earlier. I mean, it had not registered earlier. The Vedas, the Sanghitas of the Vedas, as you everyone here knows probably, they are mantras addressed to specific divinities. And in the Yajur Veda, I found a mantra which was addressed to a dog. And I thought, oh, that had not registered. So I began to collect whatever information I had on dogs. Everything. The mother of all dogs, or the Dog of the gods, same thing, is someone named Sarama, which is why dogs are known as Saramaya. And soon I had a manuscript which was called Sarama and her children. That manuscript did rounds with several publishers who turned it down before Penguin said, lovely manuscript, we want to publish it, but uh, uh, we have always wanted a translation of the Bhagavad Gita. So will you do a translation of the Bhagavad Gita? I said, yes, I've always wanted to translate the Bhagavad Gita. So that's how this journey started. Once I translated the Bhagavad Gita, I realized that my Sanskrit had improved. I was a bit more confident. And I began to think about translating the Mahabharata. The only thing that stood in the way was its formidable size at the track record of people who have translated the Mahabharata is not very good. There are at least three who died halfway. So um, I, I remember Wendy Doniger who sent me an email saying, Bibek, please be careful. Think about whether you want to start it or not. And as long as the Mahabharata translation was going on, my wife was constantly um, somewhat alarmed that is this going to finish. So that's what got me started. You've, uh, you know, when you say, and before we actually come to the texts, just a linked question. Did your study of the classical texts intersect at some point with the work you were doing? Were they two entirely distinct passions, or did you in fact find that one was feeding into the other? I, I okay, <laughs> Mike is back. I think one should be a little bit careful when one reads the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is a wonderful, wonderful text. It's a marvelous synthesis. Unfortunately, it is very fashionable. Upanishads are composed by people who had retired to the forest. They were in Vanaprastha and Sanyas. The average citizen then did exactly what the average citizen is doing today, which is, which is the average citizen then did what the average citizen is doing today, which is make money, hopefully by legitimate means, and get on with one's life. Where will that be described? That will not be described in the Upanishads. That will be described in Itihasa, which is the Ramayana and the Mahabharata and the Puranas. So the karma of a household is in these texts. When you, uh, and, and you, you said in particular about the Bhagavad Gita, that it is possibly the most widely read of the classical texts and the least understood or the most misunderstood of the classical texts or of the epics. Why do you say that? Why is the Bhagavad Gita, or in what way is it misunderstood? 
I, I, okay, my dear. I think one should be a little bit careful when one reads the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is a wonderful, wonderful text. It's a marvelous synthesis. Unfortunately, it is very fashionable. So, here are the four elements. To appreciate that, you need to read it in Sanskrit. And, and actually, I just wanted to come to, did you know Sanskrit when you started? Uh, I think there are some young people, I would strongly urge, do not do what I did, which is to try and learn Sanskrit at the age of 45, 40. And I think that was a big error on my part. So if you have the choice, please try and learn Sanskrit earlier instead of waiting till the age of 40. How did you teach yourself Sanskrit? Because this is a complex language and you have a felicity with it, not just to be able to read, but to translate. Um, a language is bhasha. Bhasha means something that is spoken. 
That's the way we learned whatever languages we learned. We began to converse. We made mistakes. We were correct. When we learned to speak English, hopefully you did not mug up Nesfield and Fowler and whatever else it is. Unfortunately, Sanskrit is very badly, badly taught. Sanskrit is taught in schools, but the way it is taught is by mugging up grammar tables. The grammar tables have a rationale of their own, which you appreciate only after you've learned some Sanskrit. So that is the worst way to learn a language. The way I learned it, normally when you learn a language, you first learn to speak it, then you learn to read it, and then you learn to write it. Because my incentive, my intention was to read the text. I learned it the wrong way around. I first learned to read it, then I learned to speak it, and then I learned to write it. Typically, it is speak, read, write. So forget what I did, but essentially what one should do is forget the grammar tables. There is something called Sanskrit Bharati, which runs, converse, which runs conversational camps in Sanskrit, including in Hyderabad. After 10 days, you will begin to converse in Sanskrit. And that is how one should start. There is... There, there, there are now CVDs, DVDs. Uh, there are ex excellent lessons on the net. I can mention some of those. So that's the way one should start. I also use some of those, but not exactly in the order that I mentioned. Before we come to a couple of the specific texts again, I just wanted to talk about translation per se. Other than the sheer volume, what was uh, the particular challenge of translation, if any, and was it a uniform challenge? For example, I think you've said somewhere that the Valmiki Ramayana is a more lyrical text, and the Mahabharata often deals more with people and situations. So the, is the quality of the text a different challenge in translating each of these? It is, a, it is, of course, a challenge, particularly when it is lyrical. Translating anything is difficult. Remember, these texts that we are talking about, they were all in poetry. Poetry of a certain type, which if we have time, we can talk about. So the first, decision, so first problem is a translation is always going to be imperfect. And I will give you an example to illustrate, which also illustrates why it is impossible to state how many words there are in the Sanskrit language. In English, the Oxford Dictionary tells us that there are about 170,000 words. Most of us, except Pyle, know about 15,000. Pyle knows about 20,000. Shakespeare knew about 30,000. Sanskrit has an infinite capacity to combine words through sandhi and samas. And I will give you an example from Kalidasa's Megdutam again. The yaksha is telling the cloud, go to Alakapuri, in Alakapuri, and here is one single word. Vahyodana sthita harashira chandrika dhautiya harimya. Single word. What is that single word telling you? Vahyodana, in the garden outside, there is a statue to Shiva, there is the crescent moon on Shiva's forehead, and the beams from that crescent moon are bathing all the mansions in moonlight. How do you translate it? You cannot. So the first decision to be taken was, do I attempt to translate in verse, which is impossible to do, if you are going to be authentic to the text. If you do it in verse, you will have to take liberties with the text. So the first decision was, let us do it, or let me do it in prose. The second challenge was, there was some, some, the sentence structure of Sanskrit is not the same as the sentence structure in English. In English, the subject is in a certain place. Normally, the verb is in a certain place. The object is in a certain place. The structure of Sanskrit is that it doesn't really matter where the object is, where the subject is. I can actually write better English. I took a conscious decision 
to translate exactly the way the words are located in the Sanskrit text. So that if you were to sit down and match the Sanskrit text with the English, you'd find an exact one-to-one -one matching. So that was a second conscious decision. I will not take liberties with the text, but will follow exactly the way the text is. The third challenge was, are you going to translate some words which are impossible to translate satisfactorily in English? Examples of those are Atman, Dharma. These are impossible to translate. And therefore, the first time round, I tried to explain what the word meant. And thereafter, I did not try to translate those words. Everything that I am now translating, with the exception of Valmiki Ramayana, is believed to have been composed by Veda Vyasa. So once the greatest challenge was the first volume of the Mahabharata, then you become familiar with the style of an author, with the language of an author. So the moment you see a sentence, 90% of the time, 85% of the time, you can get a sense of what it is without even needing, uh, reading, needing dictionaries. That's because I've got familiar with Veda Vyasa. Now, if I were to try and translate Kalidasa, that would be much, much more difficult. I, I just want to come to the fact that, um, and I was alluding to this earlier, do you really, does it matter whether you engage with these texts as history or as myth? Uh, you know, depending on where you stand on the belief spectrum, today it's a bit like the Battle of Kurukshetra. It feels like you're fighting this fight of what do these actually mean. To you, does that question even matter? How would you engage with these texts? Now, to me, the question does not matter so much. Uh, there is a difference between an incident and when the texts were composed. And it's important to make that distinction. It becomes apparent when you're asking the question in the context of the Mahabharata. Sure. So far as the composition of these texts are concerned, it was a process of oral transmission. Writing came much later. And therefore, each of these texts evolved over a period of about 1,000 years. Roughly, 500 BCE to 500 ACE. A few of the Puranas, if we have time, we'll talk about the Puranas, are about 10th century. So that's roughly the span. This is sufficiently easy to date, the composition of the texts. But you mentioned the Kurukshetra War. There are different ways of dating the Kurukshetra War. There is the ev evolution in grammar. There is geological evidence. There is genetic evidence. You will be sub there is archaeological evidence now, a lot of archaeological evidence connected with incidents around the Mahabharata. You will be surprised to know that if you leave out the astronomical evidence, all the other evidence converges to a date of around 1300 to 1400 BC, give or take 100 years. So there is reasonable consensus on the date of the Kurukshetra war. If you read the Mahabharata, you get a sense that whoever was describing things was describing real events. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting for a minute that everything occurred exactly as was described because the texts themselves evolved over a period of time. The Mahabharata itself says that there was an original text called Jaya, which was expanded into a text called the Bharata, which was expanded into a text called the Mahabharata. The astronomical ones often tend to be inconsistent because of various reasons. Reason number one, originally we used to follow lunar months, not solar months. When, reason number two, when we followed lunar months, sometimes the lunar month began with the new moon, Amavasya, in some parts. In some parts it began with the full moon, Purnima. 
Originally, our astronomical calculations were based on nakshatras. At some point, there was a transition to Rashi zodiacs. There was the precision of the equinoxes. As a result of which, if I'm going to use the astronomical references, I often get inconsistent dates. And when I said this, I've been abused. But when one uses astronomical dates, one can drag it back to something like 3100, 3102 BC or 2559 BC. We'll, we'll, um, I'd like to come to the Puranas in particular. You have said somewhere that the Puranas are in fact almost like encyclopedias, right? Will you tell us, because the Mahabharata and the Ramayana are often discussed, um, what is it about the Puranas that, that for you makes them encyclopedic? And what is the nature of knowledge contained in the 18, I think, Mahapuranas, you said? Yeah, there are 18 Mahapuranas. Well, it is said there are 18 Mahapuranas. Sometimes there is a Purana known as the Bhavishya Purana, which is sometimes included, sometimes excluded. So that's why when I earlier said I did Dana Bridge translations, I did all 19. But there are 18 Mahapuranas. Whether we realize it or not, Many of the things we do are based on the Puranas. So when we perform our sraddha ceremonies, the funeral ceremonies, they are based on the Garur Purana. Well, other Puranas also, but primarily the Garur Purana. When we follow Vastu, many of those principles are based on the Agni Purana. When we construct idols of images of gods and goddesses in a certain way based on the Agni Purana. The way our temples are constructed are based on the Matsya Purana. The rule of law, all of the Puranas have these. So that is why they are encyclopedias and that is the reason we should read them. For example, the Markande Purana, which is the one I've just translated, the entire worship, the mantras, the liturgy, of worshipping the goddess, whether it is in the eastern parts, whether it is to in the southern parts, is based on the Markande Purana. What is, uh, you've said that both the Ramayana and the Mahabharata eventually come down to questions of dharma, right? And dharma itself is a contested idea. What does dharma mean? What, how would you, having translated across the spectrum of these texts, what has dharma come to mean to you? Dharma means different people to different things in different contexts. There is Raja Dharma, which is the dharma of kings, governance, if you are going to use that word. There is Moksha Dharma, which the Bhagavad Gita is partly about, and other Gitas are also partly about. I should quickly tell you that there are actually about 51 Gitas. But the Bhagavad Gita may be the most well-known, but there are actually 51 Sanskrit Gitas listed. So the Bhagavad Gita and some of these texts are about Moksha Dharma, which is the Dharma of liberation, emancipation from the cycle of human existence, Sangsar. There is Varnashram Dharma, a template for that, depending on the Varnas and the four Ashramas, Brahmacharya, Garhastha, Vanaprastha, and Sanyas. Transcending all of these, these texts tell you that there is no absolute notion of what is good and what is bad. So unlike certain cultures where things are binary, this is good, that's bad, this is white, that is black, we have shades of grey. In exactly the same situation, two different individuals may take two different decisions because there is a conflict of dharma and reap the consequences. So dharma and karma are flip sides. Now let me give an example to illustrate. Everyone is aware that in the Mahabharata, Bhishma took a vow of brahmacharya celibacy. To state this account very briefly, the princess of Kashi, Amba, wanted Bhishma to marry her. Bhishma says, I cannot marry you because I have got a vow of Brahmacharya. Amba says, if you don't marry me, I will immolate myself. Bhishma says, no, it doesn't matter. My vow of Brahmacharya is important. 
given this conflict of dharma, he chose not to marry Amba. Amba immolated herself and, as we all know, became Shikhandi. What some people don't realize or do not know is that Arjuna also had a temporary vow of Brahmacharya for one year. Both Kshatriyas, vows of dharma dharma Brahmacharya, and the Naga princess Ulupi fell in love with Arjuna and said, if you don't marry me, I am going to kill myself. Arjuna married Ulupi because he thought that the dharma of protecting a woman's life was more important than the dharma of Brahmacharya. Each of the incidents, and I can multiply the incidents, represent a conflict of dharma. There are trade-offs. Do I do this or do I do that? She does something, I do something completely different. Important point being, I take my decision, I suffer the consequences. I wanted to, as lay readers um, of this entire gamut of text that exists, where would you suggest one starts with any kind of serious engagement to reading? You know, if you had to say, I know it's hard to prescribe, and particularly just for an audience at large, but what is a meaningful place to start an engagement with texts like these? I, th I think it depends on what kind of text and for what purpose. For example, we talked about the Bhagavad Gita earlier. If one is interested in what such texts say about moksha dharma, I would recommend not the Bhagavad Gita, but another Gita known as the Ashtavakra Gita, which is much more direct. Ashtavakra was a sage, we are probably running out of time, so I'm going to compress it. Ashtavakra was a sage who was born crooked in eight of his limbs, which is why he was known as Ashtavakra. So Ashtavakra meets King Janaka, and King Janaka asks him to instruct him. And Ashtavakra, who was still relatively young, almost a child then, instructs him. So that's the Ashtavakra Gita. And if one is interested in Moksha Dharma, Adhyata Dharma, I think the Ashtavakra Gita is much, much more direct than the Bhagavad Gita. If one is interested in poetry, then of course the Valmiki Ramayana. So far as the Puranas are concerned, I don't think my texts, because they are unabridged translations, will be read unless by people, unless they are seriously, seriously interested. I mean, for God's sake, 10 volumes, who's going to read it? Uh, our sons have not read them. Uh, so these are texts where I don't think, I think very few people will read them from cover to cover. They are to, therefore dipping into as and when necessary. For example, the Markande Puran. It has wonderful stories, but many people will just read 10% of the Markande Puran, which is the Devi Mahatya, which you are familiar with in the eastern parts of India as Chandi, in the northern parts as Durga Saptashati. So these are texts where I think people will dip in. If one is going to start with one text, which is lyrical, as I said earlier, I think I would start with the Valmiki Ramayana. So Valmiki Ramayana, Ashtavakra Gita, Puranas, take your pick. Uh, Bhagavad Purana, the tenth skanda, not all of it. And you're right, we are running out of time. I do have one question that I think will also illuminate both the process of translation, but the fact that there are so many contested versions of even the original texts, you know, what, what is the original text, whether it's for the Ramayana or the Mahabharat. And uh, I'd like you just to explain a little bit about the critical editions, which were the source or which were the documents that you used to base your translations on. What are the critical editions? Okay. Uh, we are talking about the Mahabharata in Sanskrit. There were regional variations in the Sanskrit. It was Sanskrit, it was written down in different scripts. The language being Sanskrit does not mean it was Devanagari. Devanagari is of recent vintage. In other parts, they were written down in the Tamil script, in the Bengali script, Marathi script, so on and so forth. And they all varied in very minor details. Did Veda Vyasa actually dictate to Ganesha or did he not? Those kinds of minor details. So there were 1,215 such different versions of the Mahabharata text floating around in different parts of the country. 
There is an Oriental Research Institute in Pune known as the Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute, which in the year 1916 began a huge exercise, which is to sit through all of these texts, sift through them, and try and determine, I don't have the time to explain how they did it, to try and determine which was probably the original text, closest to the original text. So it took them 50 years, 1916 to 1966. So that is known as the critical edition of the Mahabharata. So the Mahabharata translation I have done is based on the critical edition. The two earlier ones, there are just three unabridged translations as she said. The two earlier ones were 19th century, they predated the critical edition. Exactly similarly for the Ramayana, forming the, following the same tradition, by the way, so far as the Ramayana cons is concerned, there, there are at least four other Sanskrit tellings of the Rama story. Valmiki Ramayana, just as in case of the Mahabharata, for the Valmiki Ramayana, there were about 200 texts, and the Oriental Research Institute in Baroda sat down, used the same methodology, towards the end of the 70s, produced the critical edition of the Valmiki Ramayana, which is the one I have translated. Unfortunately for the Puranas, there is no critical text. The most authentic text, or so the scholars say, is something that was published towards the beginning of the 20th century by a publisher known as Ninnay Sagar. So for the sake of consistency for all the Purana translations, because there is no critical edition, no critical text, I am using the Ninnay Sagar editions. Thank you so much. This is a conversation we are only barely beginning. Thank you, Vivek. Also, thank you thank for you. Hero heroically dealing with our first ever blackout. <laughs> thank you. And the day I can speak one Sanskrit word of the kind you did, the few hundred English words I know will cease to matter. Thank you very much for your generosity. Thank you. <laughs>